from the Missouri School of Journalism. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. There's a town in a farming region of northern Syria on the main road from Damascus to Aleppo called Khan Sheikhoun. Now, in April, this town, which is controlled by rebels, made international news when President Bashar al-Assad's air force dropped bombs containing sarin nerve agent on its people. The attack killed around 100 people, many of them civilians, and injured hundreds more. The U.S., of course, responded by launching cruise missiles on one of Assad's airfields. Yet the dropping of sarin at Khan Sheikhoun has highlighted the continuing threat from chemical and biological weapons and showcased the limits of international efforts to halt their use. So on this edition of Global Journalists, we're going to talk about the development and use of these weapons and how the threats from them are changing. Now, in a few minutes, we'll be joined by a panel of experts who have tracked this issue from a few different angles. But first, we're joined from Arlington, Virginia, by Daniel Gerstein. He's a retired Army colonel and former senior official at the Department of Homeland Security. He's worked on preparations and planning for these types of attacks. Currently, he's a senior policy researcher at the RAND Corporation. Daniel, welcome to Global Journalist. Thanks for having me. Well, first, let's just review the difference between chemical and biological weapons. The anthrax letters, which many of our listeners may remember, sent back in 2001, they were an example of a biological agent. This sarin agent used in Syria is a chemical weapon. Is that right? Tell, tell us just a bit about the differences between the two. Yeah, that's correct. And, you know, many times people try to use the two interchangeably. While there might be some similarities, there are also some pretty significant differences. Let me just highlight a couple of the the similarities and differences. You know, both trace their roots back to the antiquities, uh, ancient programs, things like the use of poisons in the case of chemical, uh, in the case of biological, uh, having bodies, uh, diseased bodies catapulted into enemy camps. When we look at the two, chemical and biological, they really trace their uh, modern roots to the early 1900s. In the case of chemical, of course, it's uh, a little earlier, and then uh, World War I saw the massive use of chemical munitions, hundreds of thousands of casualties. Uh, in the case of biological, it really started approximately in 1935 uh, with uh, the Japanese unit 731. Uh, both of them are at times classified as weapons of mass destruction, uh, somewhat an unhelpful characterization in many cases, uh, you can have uh, both with lethal or incapacitating ca capabilities. The, the major difference between the two, though, is that chemicals uh, and their precursors are uh, derived. Uh, they can be chemical munitions or they can be toxic industrial chemicals, uh, whereas biological pathogens are those pathogens which exist in nature, we sometimes talk about them as being living, although uh, that's not uh, necessarily the case. Uh, you've got bacteria, which are living organisms, viruses uh, and fungi uh, and toxins, uh, which uh, are not necessarily considered to be uh, living. Well, Daniel, uh, I, I wanted to ask you, for, for nuclear weapons, there is a fairly well-known treaty called the Non-Proliferation Treaty that limits nuclear weapons to the five nuclear states, uh, calls for eventual disarmament. Is there this type of international agreement that governs the use of chemical weapons, the use of biological weapons? Uh, there is indeed. Uh, there are two separate conventions. For chemicals, it's called the Chemical Weapons Convention. Uh, it uh, entered into force in 1993, uh, and it uh, prohibits uh, the use of chemical munitions in warfare. I will say, however, there's uh, still sort there is a carve out that allows for use of chemicals and in terms of riot control agents for biological. You weapons, mean like tear gas? Like tear gas. Okay. For biological, uh, there is the unequivocal norm. It's called the Biological Weapons Convention, and it absolutely prohibits the use of biological pathogens or their derivatives in warfare. Again, there's somewhat of a carve out uh, in that uh, you are allowed to use uh, pathogens for peaceful, preventive, or prophylactic purposes in accordance with the convention. 
And just specifically about the Assad regime's use of chemical weapons, back in 2013, of course, uh, Assad did use chemical weapons. There was uh, President Obama's famous sort of red line, if you will, and then uh, the agreement to disarm, destroy those stockpiles in Syria. And then we see him using them again three years later. So where did these chemical weapons come from if they were supposedly destroyed uh, a couple years ago? Well, it appears that the regime did not comply uh, with uh, w the agreement that had been reached. We also know that in Syria, there has been the use of what we call toxic industrial chemicals. Think about chlorine or ammonia. Uh, and so uh, even if they gave up all of those stocks, there would still be uh, the potential for uh, industrial chemicals to be used in a massive sort of way in an attack. So in other words, when it comes to chemical weapons, then there are some chemicals maybe that are specifically used to sort of poison people in warfare, but others that have dual uses, like you mentioned chlorine, which is in bleach. That, that's correct. Well, let's talk about biological weapons then. What are some of the common ones? Uh, we talked about anthrax, but how difficult is it to produce these? Well, some of the more common ones are uh, anthrax, uh, tularemia or rabbit fever, uh, Clostridium botulinum, uh, which is uh, a nerve agent or a nerve uh, neurotoxin. Uh, also smallpox, although that no longer exists in nature. Uh, the only known stocks are in Russia and the United States. So that's some of the, um, the, the types of pathogens uh, that had been used in the former U.S. program and in the former uh, Soviet and then Russian programs. In terms of how easy or hard it is, what I would say is that uh, it used to take, uh, back when we had an offensive program, it really took people in the lab with good hands to be able to do a lot of the manipulations. But what we are seeing today is that uh, given the democratization, that is the proliferation of biological technology, uh, you're seeing an increasing number of people with the potential uh, to uh, use biotech for nefarious purposes. Uh, you know, for example, there are now neighborhood labs. You have the DIY or do-it-yourself movement where people are doing it in garages. And they're, they're learning how to manipulate uh, some very, very complex biological processes. And this is something that uh, is of concern uh, to those in the community who think about these issues. On the other hand, we don't want to see legitimate science, legitimate work on uh, biotechnology uh, and the living organism stop because at the end of the day, that's how we get discovery and innovation. Well, our time does grow short. We do have just about 30 seconds left, but tell us, if you would, about what the U.S. programs are for chemical weapons and for biological weapons. What, what types of weapons do we have? What types of research are we doing right now? So we absolutely do not do any sort of offensive work with either chemical or biological weapons. That is forbidden. We do not have those programs. So that's a very, very important foundation that's in accordance with international and U.S. law. Uh, but we do uh, engage in defensive work to ensure that we are prepared. So for example, I was in Department of Homeland Security. We had a specialized laboratory that allowed us to do bioforensics in case there was an attack or to be able to do threat assessments in case we saw something that was of concern, we could try to understand it in a laboratory environment. So conducting those threat assessments was absolutely key. Uh, the, there's also, uh, there are programs uh, that uh, are run particularly by the Army uh, that do defensive work uh, to protect our forces who might be overseas and in harm's way. Everything from medical countermeasures, uh, vaccines, all the way up to protective gear and uh, systems for conducting environmental sampling. So our programs are purely, purely defensive in nature. Uh, and you know what we hope to do is to be able to deter, and if not being able to deter, to be able to ensure that we are prepared in the event someone does use these sorts of weapons. Well, Daniel Gerstein, we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us. Certainly. Thanks for having me.
A reminder that you're tuned into Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. We're talking today about the evolving threats from chemical and biological weapons and international efforts to prevent their use. To broaden our discussion, we're going to bring in three other people who have been tracking these issues closely. Joining us from Leeds in the United Kingdom is Edward Spears. He's a professor of strategic studies at the University of Leeds and author of the 2010 book, A History of Chemical and Biological Weapons. Joining us from Berlin, Germany is Sarah Everts. She's a senior editor at Chemical and Engineering News, a weekly news outlet published by the American Chemical Society. And in Newark, New Jersey is Leonard Cole. He's the director of the Program on Terror Medicine and Security at Rutgers New Jersey Medical School and the author of the book, The Anthrax Letters. Welcome to all of you. Uh, Leonard Cole, let me start with you. Uh, let's back up just a bit. Most people, uh, when they think of chemical biological weapons, they think of them sort of as creations of the 20th century. Now, as Daniel Gerstein had mentioned briefly, there's actually sort of a long history of the use of, of these weapons. Yes, indeed. Uh, actually, uh, beside Daniel Gerstein's excellent uh, overview, uh, I would suggest uh, or add that uh, there was for centuries, for millennia, uh, a lack of differentiation between a biological weapon and a chemical weapon or a poison. They were both called poisons. Uh, that largely changed in the late 19th century when Louis Pasteur, a French scientist, uh, actually discovered that um, it was the uh, microorganisms of various sorts, bacteria in particular in the beginning and then later on in future decades, viruses, fungi, that were separately uh, a category by way of their ability to reproduce and cause disease. So it's really, as, uh, as Dan said, only in the early part of the, uh, ninth, of the 20th century that you began to see uh, the use of these in a differentiated way. But uh, the truth is that uh, thousands of years ago, people were engaged in biological terrorism or warfare by dropping dead animals into the wells where people would draw water from. Uh, and don't forget uh, the famous uh, poisoning of Socrates by taking hemlock, which is uh, a plant derivative, but it was ultimately seen as a poison. So these materials have been around for a long time. Uh, uh, well, I'm sorry if I could turn this to Sarah Everts then. Well, one of the issues also that Daniel mentioned was the use of chemical weapons and poison gas uh, on an industrial scale during World War I. You wrote extensively about this Nobel Prize winning German chemist who sort of viewed as the father of chemical weapons. What, what did he do? How did he justify their use? So in the early weeks of World War I, uh, the German army had great success. It was moving across Europe, um, but as the Allies ramped up their defense, um, the war became a war of trench warfare, and uh, both sides were mired in really muddy trenches. Neither could get the upper hand. And Fritz Haber, who is a famous chemist already because he had figured out how to make fertilizer from nitrogen in the air, um, approached the German military and said, let us try using uh, poisonous gas, in particular chlorine, um, which was used quite heavily in the German dye industry. It was used uh, to make dyes. And uh, many of the military leaders were skeptical. They thought it sounded like a stunt to release chlorine from cylinders. But um, Fritz Haber managed to convince uh, one commander, a commander at Flanders Fields, uh, to let him try it out. And um, they had to wait for weeks. Um, they dug uh, over 5,000 cylinders of chlorine um, along the trenches and uh, waited for the wind to blow towards the Allies. And it took quite some time. And when it finally did happen, um, the Allies had no idea of what was coming. Um, many reports say that they saw this yellow greenish gas that floated across um, no man's land. Um, and curiosity turned to terror um, as people began to um, feel the effects, which is effectively asphyxiation. Chlorine in your lungs turns into a strong acid. And um, yeah, it's uh, really terrible. And uh, effectively, it was um, so successful, um, it even surprised Fritz Haber himself. Um, they decimated um, several uh, Canadian and French um, uh, troops and uh, the problem was that uh, the army didn't the German army did not have backup so they didn't ever even actually capitalize on um, their success uh, but very quickly um, 
many people uh, on both sides um, started investigating further use of poisonous weapons. There is over 5,000 compounds uh, considered, more than 50 used on the battlefield. Um, but I think uh, one German soldier uh, named Rudolf Binding said it best um, when he heard what had happened at Flanders Fields, this first release of chlorine gas and the effects it had. He said, I am not pleased with the idea of poisoning men. Of course, the whole world will rage about it at first and then imitate us. And uh, that was pretty much what happened. Um, even though the German army led by Fritz Haber um, uh, initiated many of the major gases used in World War I, uh, chlorine, phosgene, and mustard gas, um, quickly the Allies figured out um, what the chemicals were and used them right back on the Germans. Well, that's a good jumping off point because I wanted to talk to Edward Spears then. There was this widespread revulsion at the effects of chemical weapons of gas during World War I. That didn't stop various countries from manufacturing, stockpiling them, and using them later on in the 20th century as well. Take us forward uh, up, to the, up to the present day, up to Syria. What are some of the other major incidents that have involved the use of chemical and biological weapons? Well, they were used, of course, by the Italians uh, in Ethiopia in the 1930s, uh, part of chemical uh, colonial warfare there. They were also, of course, used by the Japanese in Manchuria in the late 1930s, uh, heavily stockpiled by all the principal belligerents uh, during the Second World War, where deterrence through a threat of retaliation in kind uh, seems to have kept everybody in check, along with uh, considerable intelligence misperceptions. So in World War II, they weren't used on the battlefield in Europe. Obviously, they were used uh, during the Holocaust uh, by the Germans, but you, we didn't see their, their use sort of in warfare on the battlefield in the way that they were in World War I. Uh, no, I mean, there are some uh, speculation that some of there may be a minor usage between the Poles and the uh, Germans, but really nothing to compare with the First World War. And uh, after the war, uh, chemical weapons and indeed biological weapons, which had been developed during the Second World War, and not least by the Brits, uh, uh, become stockpiled as part of the uh, uh, Cold War buildup between the Soviet Union uh, and the Western uh, adversaries. Uh, allegations of biological warfare in Korea, but those allegations, I think, have been pretty comprehensively dismissed by John Van Cortland Moon. Uh, on the other hand, chemical weapons have been used and there was a spectacle uh, in uh, the Middle East of them being used in the Yemen. Uh, extensive dissemination of, of chemical protective kit was found during the Six Day War, uh, which led, of course, to um, speculation that the Russians had been distributing uh, these, these materials among uh, their allies. Uh, chemical weapons also used, of course, in Vietnam. Tear gas and uh, herbicides were extensively. Uh, and subsequent to Vietnam, uh, despite the reining back of the American programs in the wake of the controversies they caused, uh, we find considerable proliferation of chemical weapons, uh, particularly in the 1980s. Uh, and um, the most extensive use in the Iran-Iraq war, uh, the eight-year war of that period, uh, used certainly by the Iraqis, perhaps less so by the Iranians. And um, if I could just stop you there, we do need to just remind our listeners that they're listening to Global Journalist. We're talking today about the evolving threats of chemical and biological weapons. From anthrax to sarin nerve gas, these kinds of weapons have proven difficult to contain. We're joined today by Edward Spears of the University of Leeds, Sarah Everts of Chemical and Engineering News, and Leonard Cole, the director of the Program on Terror Medicine and Security at Rutgers, New Jersey Medical School. If you're interested in more Global Journalists, you can visit our website, globaljournalist.org. There you can access our archives and find our ongoing reports on undercover international news and human rights issues. You can also like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or subscribe to the program on YouTube or iTunes. And Leonard Cole, we, we did get some uh, good background now on chemical weapons. Tell us just briefly about the development of biological weapons. These weapons obviously have been considered beyond the pale for a century or more. What is specifically dangerous about these? Are these weapons that are more likely to be used by individuals or terrorist groups rather than by states? Uh, 
this is a very good question and it's not entirely answerable. Uh, the only uh, bioterrorism attack that we've experienced in the United States was via the anthrax letters. Here and there, there have been reports of uh, individuals trying to uh, either use botulinum toxin or ricin, which these are toxin agents that are derived from uh, plant sources, therefore biological. Um, part of the problem is, the, is the, what I call the, the biological paradox. Uh, biological weapons are the only kind, the only sort, that once exposed to the weapon, in this case a biological agent, it is still possible to uh, prevent serious harm to a person. If somebody's infected, you can have an antibiotic if it's appropriate to this particular organism that's affecting them, or a vaccine. Uh, a variety of defensive efforts are available, unlike with others. On the other hand, they pose a, an anxiety uh, attitude by many that uh, if you think you've been exposed to a biological agent, and it has an incubation period of a week or two or three, you may worry a great deal about whether you've become infected uh, and the doctors who are seeing you might well uh, worry as, uh, at the same time. So unlike other agents, biologicals have this special capability of being uh, vulnerable to protection by individuals who've been exposed and also cause a great deal of anxiety. And if they are contagious uh, and they are infectious and lethal, they can cause massive damage. Millions and millions of people can be affected by an epidemic or a pandemic and caused so, by... And Sarah not. Everts, if I could turn this to you then, one of the issues that I understand has come to the fore with respect to the use of biological weapons is that the technology, particularly in the biological sciences, has advanced very rapidly. There's a new technique for altering uh, bacteria, for altering DNA called uh, gene editing, which has a lot of uses uh, for civilian purposes, for uh, for producing different agricultural crops, but it can also be used to change diseases and their pathogens. What sorts of risks or dangers does this mean uh, in this realm in biological weapons? Well, you can weaponize them. You can make the bacteria possibly more um, s stronger uh, or resistant to um, to some some things that you would try against it. Some defenses. Um, but I guess uh, the concern is that um, biotechnology is increasingly um, is getting increasingly easier to do, and so many more people in home labs um, have the ability to work with these uh, organisms with their genetic material um, and you know to to effectively weaponize them. So this is something then that it sounds like it's more simple to create then a, a nuclear bomb where you need centrifuges and you need uranium or something like that. This is something that, that would be more accessible for, say, a small group of people to obtain. Uh, possibly. I've never tried to do it myself. Um, but yes, you don't need radioactive materials per se necessarily. Um, but chemical weapons uh, suffer the same um, facility um, as well. I mean, both are uh, chemical weapons often, um, or some of them come from industrial chemicals, as uh, one of our panel members already mentioned, which, you know, if you have a chemical industry in a country, um, these chemicals can be used for good or for bad. Well, Edward Spears, what's what's your view on this development of biological weapons? We'd mentioned earlier that there's sort of a dual use capability to doing this kind of research, where if you're researching how to make vaccines to protect your population from uh, from biological weapons, that vaccine, that research can be easily translated into making uh, an offensive weapon. Is there some inherent tension? I don't think there's necessarily a tension, but it's certainly the case that if you're going to devise appropriate uh, uh, defensive technology, both injections, both uh, protective suits, um, uh, protective equipment generally, then you've got to know how they could possibly be used in, in an offensive or a terrorist context. And so this does require some considerable thought being given by bodies like Fort Deep. Deep, deep trick in the United States, Portman Down in, in Great Britain, to reflecting on the evolving way in which these um, agents can be used by the sort of people who might be still inclined to experiment or actually use them uh, in, in um, operational circumstances.
And Leonard Cole, you work at a medical school and are focused on developing responses to these kinds of attacks. Are there some sort of specific, unique ethical issues surrounding this kind of research? Or does it pose some particularly difficult questions for researchers? Uh, I would say that the people who are researching are under great security uh, requirements uh, that have been developed since the anthrax attacks back in 2001. Um, I have uh, very close associations with people who work on what are called select agents, the types that could conceivably be biological agents. Uh, they're scrutinized carefully, their laboratories are overseen carefully. So there is a concern and therefore I think a productive effort to try to control a wayward or an unsavory character from developing these kinds of weapons in a regular laboratory. And give us just a sense, if you would, about how prepared uh, the U.S. is, about how prepared sort of the major hospitals in the country are to sort of uh, combat this type of attack, should it take place? I think, in general, we're not terribly well prepared. Part of the difficulty, and I, it's an understandable difficulty, is that, for example, immediately after the anthrax attacks back in 2001, and then continuing into 2002 with the aftermath, uh, we uh, ramped up uh, federal spending for uh, protection and also for developing counter medical countermeasures and inner general awareness. That's fallen off a bit because we haven't had any major issues that uh, have hit the front pages of the papers. Uh, and so we go about our daily lives, including doctors who uh, don't really pay too much attention to this. And I do believe that education is required and a continuing uh, sense of awareness. We're not all together where we should be in that area. And Sarah Everts, our time does grow short, but where do you see these issues moving over the next three years, over the next five years? Obviously, many people were surprised to see that chemical weapons were used in Syria. Is it, is it likely that the dynamic around this issue is going to change? Um, I can't predict the future. I think the real concern is um, that particularly uh, with chemical weapons, um, although there are antidotes safe for nerve agents like sarin um, that was used in Syria, the problem is that you need to deliver them within minutes, of, like under an hour um, in order for them to actually be able to protect people. And so although there's a lot of um, development of say gas masks and protective equipment and also antidotes, all of these things need to be um, either given pro prophylactively or given very soon after exposure. And for most um, recent attacks, um, it's been civilians um, not just in Syria, but if you think about the Tokyo subway attack. Um, and, you know, it's not going to ever happen that you're going to have civilians walking around a city carrying around um, gas protection, uh, chemical weapons protection. And so I think uh, the real threat is um, to civilians, particularly um, in the future. That's going to have to do it for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the Missouri School of Journalism and KBIA Mid-Missouri Public Radio. Our thanks to Daniel Gerstein, Edward Spears, Sarah Everts, and Leonard Cole for joining us. This week's show is produced by Rachel Foster Gimble with assistance from Trevor Hook and Needham Kassaye. Pat Akers is our audio engineer and Travis McMillan is our director. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>